Hi, this is the Mosomic MEMS microphone guide. In this episode, just like the previous one, we talk about sound and acoustics related to MEMS microphones. It might be a good idea to check out episode 1 if you haven't seen it already. In this one we'll talk about the following topics. Sound propagation, sound pressure level, Helmholtz resonance and sound reception. Stay tuned! This series is sponsored by Infineon Technologies. Hi, I'm Mikko Suvanto from Mosomic. The key question for this episode is, how does sound propagate? First of all, sound needs a medium, which is typically air, but it can also be solid objects. A sound source in air in free field transmits spherical pressure waves that radiate away from the source into all directions. Free field means that the source is not surrounded by objects and there are no reflections, so sound waves reach the observer directly and only directly from the sound emitting object. Objects near the source or in the path of the sound waves cause the field to no longer be free, as the objects cause changes in the way sound propagates. The objects can be, for example, parts of the human body, furniture, walls and so on. The waves can get, for example, reflected, diffracted or absorbed. The wavelength of sound is linked to its frequency. From this equation we see that wavelength, lambda, is the speed of sound divided by sound frequency. The speed of sound in dry air at 20 degrees centigrade or 68 degrees Fahrenheit is 343 meters per second. This means that for a low frequency sound signal the wavelength is long and vice versa, the wavelength is short for high frequency sound. The wavelengths of the sounds in the audio band vary from a really long 17 meters for a 20 hertz signal down to 17 millimeters for a 20 kilohertz signal. The wavelength of a 1 kilohertz sound is about 34 centimeters. The behavior of sound waves depends on the distance from the source. Therefore, the 3D space around a sound source is divided into two regions, near field and far field. By definition, in the near field, sound pressure and acoustic particle velocity are not in phase. In the far field, the sound particle velocity is in phase with the sound pressure. In the near field, the spherical sound waves are relatively small spheres, the curvatures of which are fairly tight. Far away from the source, the radiuses of spherical sound waves have grown so large that the wavefront is practically a plane wave, with no curvature, and the wavefronts are almost parallel planes, normal to the direction of the propagation. Typically, far field is specified as distances more than twice the wavelength of sound. It's important to note that the transition from near to far field is gradual and uh, that the division point depends on frequency. As an example, the near far field division line for a 1 kHz sound signal is at about 69 cm from the source. For a 500 Hz sound signal, the boundary is twice as far, at about 1.4 meters. For acoustic measurements, one should specify whether the measurement has been done in the near field or in the far field. In many cases, the minimum measurement distance is defined, for example 1 meter. Doing measurements in the far field is likely to make the measurements more predictable and reliable. For example, directivity measurements are usually done in the far field. The sound you hear, or the sound the microphone hears, is not necessarily the signal you intended to capture. There can be imperfections and added components in the sound signal. The relative amplitudes of different frequencies may have changed. Some frequencies get attenuated more than others as the sound propagates. There may be ambient noise or wind noise in the signal. There can also be phase inconsistency that may be caused by, for example, sound reflections as the sound propagates. Also the microphone itself can alter the signal. A microphone is a transducer that converts sound to electricity. It's likely to add imperfections to the captured sound signal. The changes may be, for example, 
altered frequency balance, noise, distortion, phase inconsistencies, and so on. We'll talk more about this in another episode. If the incoming sound is very quiet or very loud, it increases the risk of uh, the signal being altered by the microphone. This is related to the dynamic range of the microphone or the microphone system. We'll talk more about this in another episode. The parameter sound pressure level, SPL, tells us how strong a sound signal is. It's the amplitude of the sound pressure wave. The unit is decibel. 20 micropascals RMS is commonly used as the reference sound pressure level, 0 dB SPL. 20 micropascals is the threshold of hearing at 1 kHz for a young, healthy person. This illustration shows you the range of sound pressure levels, from 0 up to the highest sound pressure levels that we encounter in our everyday lives. The values naturally depend on a lot of factors, so most of these are approximate values to give you an idea of the general levels. The lower end of the sound pressure level spectrum, down to the quiet room level, about 40 decibels or a little bit lower, has much more general significance than the loudest levels we see here. Still, in many cases a device user can benefit greatly of a microphone system in his or her device that is capable of cleanly handling also the louder sounds. Such a case can be, for example, recording at a live music concert. Currently, the lowest sound pressure level that a mass-produced MEMS microphone can handle without adding significant amounts of noise is between 30 and 35 decibels. So far, the highest level that microphone systems with the best high SPL capabilities have handled while keeping a decent distortion level is about 140 dB SPL. We'll take a look at some key sound pressure levels next. 94 dB RMS equals 1 Pascal RMS. It is used as a reference level in acoustical measurements. The higher the sound pressure level is, the more difficult it is to handle for both human ears as well as microphones. A level above 85 dB can damage hearing. This level can be reached, for example, at an assembly factory or in loud street traffic. More than 100 decibels can cause permanent damage in as little as 15 minutes. Some of the loudest sounds to be captured with microphones occur in music concerts and motorsports events, where the root mean square SPL can be 110 or even higher. 120 decibels can cause immediate hearing damage. At the low end of the sound pressure level spectrum, we have anechoic chambers. They're used for precise acoustic testing, for which low ambient noise and elimination of reverberations are important. The elimination of reflections means that the measurements are free field measurements. Depending on the specifications of the chamber, the sound pressure level in there typically varies between 5 and 15 decibels. The sound pressure level you hear, or the microphone hears, doesn't only depend on the loudness of the source, it depends on the distance too. In the far field and in free space, Sound pressure level from a point source halves drops by 6 dB for every doubling of the distance from the sound source. This is an important fact related to, for example, the audibility of a sound signal and the noise performance requirements for microphone systems. Sound attenuation is also the reason why I'm wearing a lavalier mic instead of using the built-in microphones in the camera I'm using. The lavalier mic is about 25 centimeters from my mouth. If the camera is 2 meters away, I could get as much as 18 decibels more signal by using the lavalier microphone. I could also easily place the microphone closer to my mouth, at about 12 centimeters, to gain another 6 decibels of improvement. These are very significant differences that help improve the signal-to-noise ratio of the captured signal. The result is that the noise ends up being at a significantly lower level, when the level of the electrical signal at the microphone output is set to the desired level, as compared to the case where the sound pressure level of the incoming sound signal, for example speech, would be 18 decibels lower. A higher level output signal needs less amplification, which means that the self-noise of the microphone itself is less of a concern. Also, the ambient noise picked up by the microphone is at a lower level in relation to the wanted speech signal, if the speech source is close to the microphone. 
In everyday situations, sound rarely propagates in a perfectly free space, and therefore the exact attenuation rate varies. I'll talk more about how the surroundings affect sound propagation in a minute. For a line source that produces cylindrical spreading of sound, the attenuation rate is lower, only 3 decibels per doubling of distance from the source. For example, traffic on a road can in many cases be thought to be a line source. As you can see in the illustration here, speech, for example a voice command, talked out at 60 decibels at 8 meters distance, approaches the ambient noise level of a typical quiet room, about 40 decibels. This must be taken into account in microphone systems designed for capturing distant sources. Luckily, people have a natural tendency to talk louder when the distance is long, so it compensates the situation. Also other objects play roles. For example, walls, furniture and other acoustic objects affect the propagation and attenuation of sound. Soft materials can absorb sound waves and cause faster attenuation of the signal. Also, amplification of the whole signal or parts of it can occur because of reflections from hard surfaces. Placing the sound source in a corner where it's surrounded by the floor and two walls can result in as much as 9 decibels of amplification. This is a big factor, as an increase of 10 decibels is perceived by an average person as a doubling of the sound volume. Indoors, sound can get reflected from walls back towards the recipient, for example the microphone, so the attenuation rate can be smaller than the 6 dB per doubling of distance. Often, the amplification caused by reflections is unwanted, because the reflected signals arrive at the microphone later than the directly propagated sounds causing issues with phase and clarity of the captured sound. Edges of obstacles cause diffraction, which causes sound to disperse, and thereby attenuate. Outdoors, wind can have a significant effect on sound propagation. Wind can either blow sound away, causing it to attenuate faster when it blows to the wrong direction, or make sound travel surprisingly long distances towards the downwind direction. The speed and direction of the wind determine how sound is affected. Other weather phenomena, such as local air temperature differences or height-dependent wind strength changes, can also cause the sound to be refracted. In other words, the sound waves change their direction. You may have noticed the effects of wind, the sound level and sound color fluctuating at an outdoor concert on a windy day. Wind also causes noise in a microphone that can be difficult to mitigate without large and or complicated wind protection systems. In many cases, microphones have to handle an enormous sound pressure range. The loudest signal peaks can rise up to above 130 dB SPL. At the other end of the spectrum, microphones should also be able to pick up very weak sounds coming from distant sources without drowning the signal in noise. This requires having the noise floor below 30 dB SPL. The needed range can be well above 100 decibels, and this is an enormous range for any microphone or electronics to handle. We'll talk more about dynamic range in another episode. A key phenomenon related to microphone acoustics is Helmholtz resonance. If you have a tube, or a slit, and a cavity, or an air volume acoustically connected to each other, you have a Helmholtz resonator. A common example of a Helmholtz resonator is blowing into a bottle, which causes a whistling sound. The frequency of the whistling is determined by the dimensions of the Helmholtz resonator. Therefore, the amount of liquid in the bottle affects the frequency. A Helmholtz resonator has a big impact on the acoustic structure of a microphone and the mechanical and acoustical implementation of a microphone into a device. A Helmholtz resonance amplifies some frequencies over other frequencies. This effect is typically unwanted, but in some cases it can be used for the advantage of the system. The dimensions of a Helmholtz resonator determine the location of the resonance and the height of the resonance. We'll talk more about the frequency responses of microphones and microphone systems in another episode. At least one cavity and one tube are needed for a Helmholtz resonator. Therefore, to reduce the effect of the resonator, you can do two things. You can reduce the size of the cavity, or eliminate it completely, 
or you can widen the tube or eliminate it completely also. Here's a simple illustration of how to mitigate the Helmholtz resonance. In other words, move the resonance to a higher frequency or, if possible, to eliminate it completely. Here's the original situation where the Helmholtz resonator looks like it will limit the frequency range of the microphone system significantly. Making the cavity smaller by decreasing the cross-sectional area, in this case diameter, of the cavity and reducing its height help push the resonance to a higher frequency. In an optimal case, the cavity would be eliminated by making the cross-sectional areas of the cavity and the tube the same, effectively forming a single uniform tube without a cavity. When a microphone is implemented into a device, there are lots of factors that uh, affect the dimensions of the mechanics, like the cavities and the tubes, and therefore the acoustics for the microphone are typically a compromise. I'll talk more about Helmholtz resonance when I talk about the acoustic structure of a microphone, the frequency response of a microphone or a microphone system, and the acoustic implementation of a microphone into a device. Another key question for this episode is, how can sound be received? In episode 1 we learned that sound is pressure and particle velocity oscillations in air. And therefore, to receive sound, we need an object that vibrates along with those oscillations in air. In this drawing we have sound waves arriving from the left. They are received by a sound sensor, in this case a pair of parallel plates, one of which is rigid and the other one excited to oscillate by the sound. The movement of the two parallel plates in relation to each other can be converted into a signal that is output from the microphone. Transforming the mechanical vibrations into an electrical output signal enables the reproduction or storage or both of the signal. The output can be an analog or a digital signal. The vibrating element can be, for example, a membrane, a ribbon or a piezoelectric lever. The sensing element usually serves also as an electrical component in an electrical circuit. The sensor can be, for example, an electrical capacitor, the capacitance of which varies when sound makes it vibrate. Sound pressure variations cause variations in the electrical properties of the sound sensor. And these variations are proportional to the variations in the air pressure caused by the sound. And the variations in the electrical properties can then be converted into the output of the microphone. Okay, that's it for this episode. In this one we talked about the sound pressure level, Helmholtz resonance, as well as the reception of sound. In the next episode, episode 3, we'll talk about the acoustics inside a MEMS microphone. Thanks for watching. I hope I'll see you around. Cheers! If you have any comments or questions, write them down in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. You can also contact me online or on social media. If you liked what you saw here, give a like for the video and subscribe to the Mosomic channel. That way you help me reach more people and thereby create more content. If you need more in-depth microphone training than what you saw here, contact me and we can arrange it. The training can be adapted to suit any interests and skill levels, and the customer can choose the location and duration of the course. Mosomic provides also consultation services in all things related to MEMS microphones. If you're a microphone buyer, I can help you select the right components for your product and manage your microphone suppliers. I can also assist in implementing the microphones into your device. For microphone manufacturers, I provide microphone marketing, product definition, product management, and development management services. I can also help you create all kinds of MEMS microphone documentation.